I'm terribly sorry to interrupt your day, but I feel the need to warn you about the next speaker, who doesn't deserve to be here. I can only assume the organizers made a clerical error and thought they were booking a different Steve Chapman, one with intellect and wisdom, a true thought leader. This Steve Chapman is a compliant enough human being, but is punching way above his weight by even considering walking onto this stage. I have been telling him for many years that he has ideas way above his station that are only going to lead to his spectacular public humiliation. I fear that moment is about to come, and I will take no pleasure in telling him, I told you so. I can only apologize on his behalf and suggest you use the next short while to check your emails until the next proper speaker arrives. Meet my inner critic, that whisper in my ear who constantly reminds me that I'm not good enough, that my creativity is bad, that I should play it safe and not take risks, not try anything new, because I'll probably make a fool of myself. He's a familiar character, someone that's been there my whole life, but someone I took a particular interest in a few years ago. In September 2012, I spent a week training with a guru named Keith. Keith was and still is a hero of mine, and I took the opportunity of meeting him for the first time to let him know I was writing a book about creativity, inspired by his work. Keith was incredibly enthusiastic, and buoyed by his encouragement, I set off to continue working on the project. A year later, September 2013, I was once again with Keith. I gave him an update, told him some of the chapter headings, the fact that my six-year-old daughter was illustrating it. That sounds really interesting. I'd love a copy when it's done, said Keith. So a year later, after three years' hard work, I was once again with Keith, September 2014. I presented him with a copy of the published book that I'd signed to thank him for his influence. Keith accepted it with gratitude and placed it carefully in his bag. A few days later, he approached me during a break and said, I'd like to buy you a coffee after class. Wow, I thought, a one-to-one -one audience with my hero. Then that voice started whispering in my ear, he's going to tell you it's the worst book he's ever read and you're a total failure. I told a friend about my concerns and she reassured me, of course Keith was going to love it. It was a book that was based on a master's dissertation that got exceptional marks. So as we sat in the rather blandly decorated bar of Keith's hotel, I started to smile inside. Maybe he was going to like it. Maybe this was going to be the moment that I proved to my inner critic that I was good enough. Keith looked at me and grimaced slightly and then said, about this book, I think you should withdraw it from sale, tell everyone you've made a mistake, get some help and start again. I think this book will damage your business. The world felt like it stopped spinning for a moment. Everything apart from Keith's face went out of focus. My chest tightened, my cheeks flushed, my heart felt like it was going at a thousand miles an hour. Keith carried on talking, but I couldn't hear him. I had a one-to-one -one audience with my hero, and all I wanted to do was run away, hide, and never have a creative thought again. In that moment, my inner critic felt like it had quadrupled in size, had me in the palm of its hand and was slowly crushing me with his powerful grip telling me with venom and malice, I told you so. The inner critic, or superego as Freud called it, is our idealized sense of self, an unattainable, imagined, perfect version of us that never fails at everything and receives the adoration for other human beings for being a master at literally everything. It manifests in us day to day as a self-doubt that causes us to distrust our intuition and our instincts, a voice whose constant narrative of comparison and judgment stifles spontaneity and creativity, replacing it with self-doubt and shame. Now, for someone else, that afternoon with Keith may have been inconsequential, just one person's opinion that was, after all, coming from a genuinely well-intentioned place. But for me, it was the perfect storm for my inner critic. It ticked all of his boxes, it pressed all of his buttons. And in that moment, he stole my hero's words to use as compelling evidence that he was right all along and that I wasn't good enough. It took me a while to recover from that day, but when I did, I had an even more of a renewed interest in this character. So I decided to start an MI5-style investigation into him. A covert inquiry where I gather evidence on this shady creature. 
where he hung out, what did he like to do, where did he train, what did he look like. Like a police artist sketching a witness impression of a suspect, I started to draw him, which yielded some fascinating results. Some of the early pictures were of a professorial type chap who would just look at me and shake his head and tutter everything I did. But over time, he evolved into an equally disapproving, sinister Zen monk style character. Both men, both older than me, and both possessing more academic or spiritual wisdom than I thought I could ever attain. But the really interesting thing was the more I drew him, the more detail I added, the more he evolved and morphed. Like a mythical shapeshifter that realizes it's been spotted and now desperately trying to avoid capture. And it was in that moment I thought, I'm onto him. The dance has begun. I continued to dig dirt on this character. On a visit to my parents' house, I excavated some old school reports from the loft. And on reading them, had a simultaneous sense of anger and excitement. As somebody that now knows I suffered from dyslexia and self doubt at school, the anger arose from repeated descriptions of a young boy who would not achieve anything because he simply didn't try hard enough or make enough effort. But the excitement arose from a realization that the words in these dusty old documents were almost verbatim what my inner critic tortured me with on a regular basis. It was like I'd found one of his secret training manuals, one of his sacred parchments. I decided I needed to confront him about all of this, so I made a puppet of him. Which would enable me to have an adult to adult conversation with him. <laughs> and in doing so, I realized that if I stripped back his dramatic playground style exaggerations, there really wasn't much substance to what he said. In fact, it seemed he was the fraud, he was the charlatan, he was the imposter. I was becoming quite obsessed with all of this, so I started to tell other people about him and was surprised to learn that they too had their own inner critics. So I encouraged them to start drawing them. Resulting in a beautifully bizarre online gallery of inner critic artist impressions. Some of them were very similar in terms of appearance and apparent origin stories. Many were different and diverse and unique. Some were bizarre and surreal <laughs> and scary. But for all of the diversity of their appearance, no matter where I went, they all seemed to have variations of the same basic message that they just repeated over and over again. You are not good enough, and you are incapable of becoming good enough. A horribly twisted psychological knot that's difficult to escape from. But it seemed I'd found the answer. My inner critic had been suspiciously quiet since I started my investigation, so I assumed all I needed to do was to carry on, and then he'd give up for good. Then one morning I received an email. I'd been nominated to do a high profile talk on creativity, and was really excited at the prospect of taking my work to a global audience. I was hoping the email was going to be my invitation to speak. But when I read it, my heart sank. The quality of speakers this year has been exceptional, and we will not be inviting you to speak on this occasion. I felt the beast rising on my shoulder, his form more hideous and misshapen than he had been previously. He didn't speak because he needed no words. I could tell what he was telling me in every fiber of my body. And in that moment, I realized that this is a game without end. An ongoing game of cat and mouse, like a slightly more psychologically disturbing version of Tom and Jerry. For every one of his wily schemes to get me, I would come up with an equally cunning creative response to lure him out into the light. I've been working with masks for a number of years and knew they were a potent way of getting in touch with the dark recesses of our personality. So I made a mask of him so I could literally stand in his shoes, walk, talk, think, and feel like him. I enrolled in the Hoffman process, an incredibly intensive seven day psychological retreat where I learned about some of the origins of his power and authority, the early parental influences, the words of teachers and other authority figures that I'd swallowed whole as true descriptions of who I was and who I had the potential to become. Through Alexander technique lessons, I learned the effect he had on me physically and as a tall man, why I always made myself smaller because he'd tell me to stand up straight, tall and centered. He's arrogant. And setting myself up for failure. And using a surprisingly simple art therapy technique, I discovered that alcohol was one of his secret weapons. In his most vicious moments, he'd say, Come and have a drink, that will quieten me. And the moment I did, he'd say, Why are you drinking? You should be ashamed. And right now, he's telling me that for this talk on this stage to be any good, I should be telling you that I defeated him, I slayed him. And I should be telling you that you too can just follow my three simple steps to inner bliss. But that simply isn't true. The dance continues, and I suspect it always will. 
but an acceptance that this is just part of being a self-aware, self-regulating, fully functional, creative human being has been the most liberating thing. An influential Gestalt psychologist called Arnie Beisser suggested that human change is paradoxical, and that we get more change by becoming more deeply aware of who we are rather than striving to be something we're not. It seems our stuckness when working with the inner critic arises from our default response to try and fight it or prove it wrong, which just results in us trying to improve, which plays into its hands, and it's not already good enough driver. The biggest thing that I've discovered from this inquiry over the last three or four years is that the practice of bearing witness is the most potent thing. A deeper awareness and acceptance of what is, without judgment. To learn to dance with the inner critic, rather than to fight it. The eminent Zen writer Thich Nhat Hanh suggests that if we have an energy within us that we wish to transform, we need to take care of it rather than to battle with it, or else it will destroy us. I like to call this practice taking care of my demons. I see you, my little inner critic. I know you're well-intentioned. I'm here for you now. And in doing all of this, I've developed a relationship with him. He's now more of an annoyance than an authority, like an irritating flatmate that you learn to live with because they pay the rent. <laughs> I've even developed an empathy for the poor thing, whose role early in life was to keep me safe and maintain those important early relational connections. But the most exciting thing has been that, as the inner critic despises creativity, gets him to know him in more and more imperfect creative ways really messes with his mind. Ironically, my creative nemesis has become my creative muse and source of inspiration. I've come to believe that creativity is simply our human capacity to experience and express difference in service of change and transformation. So imagine the potential in the room if each of us was able to fully liberate our creative hope and ambition. And at the same time, imagine the power that our collective inner critics would have to stifle all of that if we continue to let them operate underground like some United Nations of Bond villains. We cannot bring forth our fully flawed but willing human selves in an atmosphere of self-judgment and comparison, but we can use any number of creative, playful and experimental means to lure these creatures out of the shadows and into the light, where we can get a good look at them and see them for what they are, and maybe reclaim some of their power for ourselves. Thank you.